Okay. So uh, today, you everybody got the paper. So now this is an, an exclusive. It's not the same as an appendix. <laughs> And the reason why I call it exclusive is because it's not from Palmieri directly, because uh, Palmieri does not discuss this question at great length. I mean, he discusses it enough, like every theologian d does, quickly, basically. But obviously, it's not as, as much of... Uh, and I mean, it, it did not have the importance at the time that it has today. So this is absolutely important for you today to know. So y that paper, you really need to, to keep it for reference. And... Um, uh, so I, I wrote that myself, but obviously as you will see it's a lot of quotes. It's not just I mean it's not my own stuff. Basically, it's it's just quotes uh, putting put together, and uh, the the bishop read it and approved it and uh, agreed uh, that I use it in class to uh, address this question of the heretical pope, uh, because obviously it's a very relevant question today. So uh, you see it's it it has a number of pages. So we'll start today, probably finish tomorrow. A simple observation raises the question of a heretical pope, obviously it's the <laughs> what is happening today, especially with Bergoglio. Uh, <laughs> many Catholics troubled by the current crisis in the church have had recourse to the famous theological question of the heretical pope. Indeed, faced with the enormity of the outrageous statements issued by the Vatican II popes, quote unquote, it is evident to anyone that many things professed by them are in contradiction to Catholic dogma the denial of hell, for example, I mean, just one among many, many things. Uh, first question, clarifying the issue, what do we mean by heretical pope? And this is actually where uh, a lot of SSPX people and R&R &R as a rule get it wrong. So when the, w there is the theological hypothesis of the heretical pope, it means the pope being a heretic as a private person, not in his magisterium. But uh, first, terms need to be defined. When speaking about the issue of a heretical pop, let us first clarify what we are about to discuss. We need to define what a heresy is, briefly, because uh, you should be familiar with that now, what a heretic is, and whether the pop could fall into heresy, before we proceed to answer the question as to what would happen if a pop were to fall into heresy. So heresy is a doctrine contrary to the faith, as you know, uh, so you take it, uh, I put like, uh, taken in, in its stricter meaning, it is a proposition denying a truth belonging to divine and Catholic faith. That means, now you should know divine and Catholic faith, it means it's actually revealed by God and defined by the church as having indeed been revealed by God. And that could be done either by a solemn pronouncement or in the universal ordinary magisterium of a church. Uh, so indeed, I, I'll summarize here quickly that the deposit of revelation is found in both sacred scripture and tradition, and the church is the proximate rule of the faith, so the church will determine, interpret, infallibly, what is indeed contained in this deposit of revelation. Um, so I give the example of the Assumption of Our Lady. Uh, so it would be, obviously... Uh, heresy to deny the assumption of Our Lady, but also things that are defined or belong to the ordinary universal uh, magisterium. Uh, so I put the example of uh, the guardian angels. So to deny that would also be a heresy. Uh, although you don't actually have a solemn dogma uh, saying it, but it's the universal magisterium of a church. You even have a feast day for that in the calendar. Uh, so the Vatican Council defined the following. Wherefore, by divine and Catholic faith, all those things are to be believed which are contained in the Word of God as found in Scripture and tradition and which are proposed by the Church as matters to be believed as divinely revealed, whether by her solemn judgment or in her, in her ordinary and universal magistrate. So this you know already because you actually have been quizzed on that. <laughs> and I actually asked that, I think. Right? I think I asked for that precise quote. Uh, a heretic pertinaciously denies a truth of the faith. So here you have the definition given by canon law itself. Uh, after the reception of baptism, if anyone retaining the name Christian, <laughs> we have two at least here, uh, <laughs> pertinaciously denies or doubts something to be believed from the truth of divine and Catholic faith, such a one is a heretic, as opposed to Apostasy, where you don't even claim to be Christian, 
quote unquote anymore. Except if that is your first name, I suppose. A heretic is therefore someone who adheres to a heresy, knowing that it is a heresy. So, uh, for canon law, I mean, I, I don't put it there, it's more in another part, but you have heresy as a doctrine, so which is what we explain. All right, so uh, denying the assumption of Our Lady would be a heretical doctrine. And then you have a sin, that is, when you deny the truth of the faith. So in your mind, you know that the assumption has been defined by the church and you just reject it. You don't want to believe it. That is a sin of heresy. If you say it externally, if you say it or write it or manifest it externally, it becomes a delict or a crime. It's the same. In the, in the new code of canon law, delict and crime means the same thing. In many civil laws, sometimes it, it doesn't, like it, there is like a gradation of things. Uh, in France, we have three things, I think, infraction and delict and crime, whatever. But in any case, here it's the same. Delict, crime, is the same thing. But what is important to understand is that, okay, this, this really is what matters uh, as far as the question of heretical power, but it does presuppose the sin. That is, it, the person is actually pertinacious. It knows what it's doing and that, that uh, what, is, uh, what she says or what he says is, is, uh, is wrong. And that presupposes that indeed you have a doctrine actually um, that's against the faith, right? So they, they do presuppose each other. But sometimes, uh, just the side note, sometimes you will hear people argumenting uh, that like a public sin of heresy uh, makes you lose the office or something like that. It's a little, it's uh, improper in the sense that what really makes you lose the office is heresy in as much as it is a delict because a sin when it becomes public that is manifested externally is called a delict, all right, or a crime, it's the same. So do not try to be, ah, okay, you know, but you're speaking about delict, uh, it's not the same, we're speaking about sin. Yeah, it's, it's the same. <laughs> we are speaking about the same. So, except if you, if you want a sin that would not be a delic, would basically would be like an internal sin. That is, nobody, you told nobody about it, it's only in your thoughts. Okay? That would be a pure sin that would not be a delict. But if you say it, even if you are uh, in private, even if you are alone, you committed a delict. It has been manifested externally. That's very important. You had a question, uh, Aidan? Uh? Okay, let's see. Yes, even if, even if you are alone, you, if you externalize it, uh, then obviously it doesn't have all of <laughs> like it, the consequences would not be the same, obviously, if you do it in your room. But uh, still, it's actually, strictly speaking, a delict. Okay, it's a little bit like um, if you dream about, uh, you know, speeding uh, 100 miles an hour, well, it's just a sin. Well, I guess it depends. <laughs> But at least if it's in a dangerous situation, it would be a sin to, f to, to dream about that, to desire that, right? But then when you do it, it's actually a delic, whether you get caught or not, whether you are sin or not sin. You understand? So this is the same. Even if nobody actually, per accident, hears you or sees you, uh, it's still a delict because it's against the law. All right? So uh, that being said, you, ha you need those two things, however, it does presuppose uh, that is this something heretical and then that you have pertinacity and that is externalized. But both things need to be externalized. That is, in order really that it has all consequences, first, something that is indeed against the faith, but also that you know it's against the faith and you don't care. Okay, those two elements enter in the notion of a delict, which is why most of the time, you will have a process of munitions, as you, I'm sure, heard about, because somebody will say something heretical, but then you'll be like, okay, we have to make sure that he really meant it in the wrong way, which you will, that, that kind of certainty you will acquire uh, through munitions. So then you will establish not only the fact that it's a heretical doctrine, what he said, but that he actually said that uh, knowing that it was heretical, okay? Now, sometimes it's clear by the very fact, so we'll see that. Uh, okay, not every error or blasphemy is a heresy as a consequence. Now, it should be clear for you now, because we, we saw the different uh, categories of um, uh, theological knots. So certain things are errors, or they might be 
Um, like they sound bad, let's say, uh, but they are not necessarily heresies. So it follows from the above principles that not all the outrageous things uttered by the modernists are heresies, that's number five, but many of their errors would be worthy of some lower censure because they deny a doctrine which is not considered to be immediately revealed or which has not yet been defined by the church as such. Nonetheless, the Vatican II popes have also clearly denied truths which would be classified as being of divine and Catholic faith. Uh, thus, the existence of hell has been denied by Bergoglio on a number of occasions. So I, I put that one as an example because this one is so obvious. But um, you, know, you can add whatever you, you prefer. Now, number six is very important. The theological hypothesis of a heretical pope considered a case of a pope becoming a heretic as a private person. No theologian, whatever they think about the situation of, of the heretical pope, none of them f is dreaming about a, a pope that would actually be the pope while teaching heresy. This is something that did not even enter their mind. They're not even addressing that. Uh, it's not possible. So it's only as a private person, like he, it's his opinion, he might share it with friends or something, but it's not in the official teaching. So another point which should be made very clear before we proceed to answer the question of a heretical pope is that when speaking of a heretical pope, theologians speak of a person of a pope becoming a heretic as a private person. Theologians agree that the pope could not teach heresy in his magisterium as the Roman pontiff. They only discuss the hypothesis of a pope falling into heresy inasmuch as he is a private person. And here I put a little bit of logic uh, because uh, it, if you know your logic well, they will make, that will make a lot of sense. So to express this in terms taken from logic, the expression heretical pop should be understood as what is called a material appellation. That's normally for first year philosophy from your logic. Uh, material appellation. So you have formal appellation, material appellation. I put a few examples here, but I can, instead of reading, I can just explain to you. Uh, it's when you apply a concept to another one. Uh, so let's say you say that John is a good mechanic. Okay, that means he's really gifted in the art or the knowledge of taking care of cars. Basically, like he he's good in mechanic. That doesn't mean, all right? But his his two things. He's a private individual. He's a man, and then yes, he happens to know mechanic. All right. So. In that case, formal appellation is on the form, that is, you apply good to the form, mechanic, as opposed to material, where you apply it to man. Okay, so you, c you can speak about the good thief, for example, I think I, I put that example here. The good thief, you know, the one that converted on the cross, this is not a formal appellation, obviously. It's a material appellation because <laughs> we're not speaking like he was really a good thief, like he stole a lot, you know. No, <laughs> that's not what we mean, obviously, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> what we mean is actually he converted. This is why he's called a good thief. Okay, he converted. He repented. So he was good, not in as much as he was a thief, but in as much as he was a man. So that's called material appellation. It seems obvious in this example, right? But it should be as obvious the same thing for the heretical pope, that is, when we say, when we say heretical pope, it's not a formal appellation, it's a material appellation. A pope is two things, you have the man and the papacy, the man being the matter and the, the papacy being the form, that is from St. Robert Beramin and others, all right? Um, so formal appellation would be to say, ah, oh, it's a man, he might be good faith, bad faith, I don't care, but <laughs> his papacy is heretical. That's impossible, that's like against dogma. Material appellation is to say no. The papacy, no, 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 the papacy obviously is fine. The man is a heretic. He became a heretic, all right? That is very important. Because every time that I see this argument addressed, many times, so there will be, um, Basically, people will be speaking like, like, like deaf people, like in the sense that they don't understand each other, because one of them, on one side, they will sp be speaking about, hey, look, he's teaching heresy, and the, on the other side will say, well, but, you know, the heretical pop is not the post, blah, blah, blah. This, this, those are two different questions. If he's teaching heresy, imposing heresy, we're speaking about a heretical papacy. And that's, that is where it contradicts dogma, all right? 
And this is what we are facing today with Bergoglio and the predecessors. And then there is the other question as to whether or not he, as a person, is a heretic, meaning he is basically he actually said or wrote or something uh, that he does not believe in some truth of the faith. Those are two different questions. That is very important. And most, again, most of the time when I see different debates, uh, it's, a, it's a all equivocation. Because those are two different things. So it's an equivocation. I have seen Avrier actually do that, like, compl <laughs> straightforward, completely. <laughs> Completely wrong. Like uh, he's teaching heresy. Yes, but John of Saint Thomas says, "Well, all right, John of Saint Thomas is speaking about this, not this." So that is very important. Uh, so you have the whole text that where I explain this here. Uh, okay. As a consequence, no, no, no. Well, I guess uh, I, we don't. I don't need to read number six because I just said it myself. All right, so let's go to number seven. Uh, relations between private heresy and heretical teaching. These arguments, so those two, are two entirely distinct arguments. On the one hand, from the fact that the Vatican II popes, quote unquote, teach heresy, we can conclude with absolute certainty that they are not, in fact, true popes, since they show themselves to not be assisted by the Holy Ghost. On the other hand, the reason why they are not true popes cannot be deduced from this argument alone. All right, because it needs to be further studied since, one, someone could lack infallibility without, however, necessarily being a pertinacious heretic. That's my case. <laughs> I'm not infallible, but I'm not a pertinacious heretic. You can take my word for it. Uh, so, <laughs> even though actually I'm one of the YouTube videos with Diamond Brothers as being a heretic, but in any case, I'm not. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not infallible, right? So it's not big, it's like, it's not just, oh, you're not infallible, therefore you're a heretic. It could be a lot of reasons why. Well, I'm not the Pope, <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> and you can be not the Pope for a lot of reasons. So, and second, the argument presupposes that the papacy is always lost by the very fact of manifest heresy, which we'll see uh, is a little bit more complicated than that. So, hence, to use the argument of loss of office through public heresy, it is not enough to prove that the Vatican II Popes have taught heretical doctrines, to say, ah, there is a heresy in Vatican II, that's not enough to say they are heretics. Uh, which, however, is enough to prove that they are not, in fact, popes. But one must also prove that, one, the Vatican II popes are, in fact, public heretics, whose pertinacity is also public to the whole church. And secondly, we will have to prove that the papacy is lost by that very fact. So this is what those two things would have to be proven in order to make an argument based on uh, the, uh, that somebody would lose a papacy because he's a pub, uh, heretical pub or public heretic. As we shall see later, many theologians did teach, in fact, that the heretical pope would lose the papacy by the very fact of becoming a manifest heretic. We shall comment on this later. Obviously, that's the main point of this paper. But let us here make the following remark, which flows from the principles explained above. Even if, by hypothesis, the heretical pope would indeed lose at once the papacy, the act by which he would manifest his heresy and lose the papacy must necessarily precede the teaching of heresy as supreme pastor. So what am I saying? If you are saying, I will just take a, uh, the example with Paul VI. If you are saying Paul VI lost the papacy because he promulgated Vatican II, he became a public heretic, you are basically saying that he promulgated Vatican II as a pope, which is impossible, and then, because he was a public heretic, he lost the papacy. It can't be, in the sense that if he was able to promulgate Vatican II, he already somehow should not be the Pope already, before. You see? So it, the, the act by which you lose the papacy cannot be the one by which you promulgate heresy to the church. Because then you have a problem here, that you are supposing this one, which we say is against dogma. Okay? Is that clear for everybody or what? Eden? Yes, that's very important too, is that this is a sign, if, if, you, if you see a heretical papacy, it's a sign that the person is not a pope, but if somebody is a public heretic, and we'll see the, you know, the precisions that you have to add to that, but 
just in a general way, if somebody is a public heretic, then he can't be the pope. Okay? But that's a cause. So one is a sign, the other is a cause. So it's not because you see a sign that necessarily it was because of that cause. It could be, but it's not necessary. Okay? So those are two different arguments. And if you have proven that, it's, it's not enough yet to jump to prove that one. For in teaching the church, the Pope is infallible and could not fall into heresy, as you know. This falling of into heresy would have to happen beforehand. In other words, the act by which a Pope would become a manifest heretic cannot be identical with the act by which he would try to impose heresy on the universal church. So that's just, a, it's just logic, basically. It's just if you think about it, it makes sense. The promulgation of heresies and evil disciplines is certainly an infallible sign of absence of authority in a claimant to the papacy, which, uh, sorry, but it cannot be the cause of it, which necessarily must precede such a promulgation. Now, number eight is uh, just because this paper is mainly uh, about the question of a pope who would lose the papacy through heresy, because that's the case that theologians actually studied. The hypothesis of a pope falling into heresy and therefore losing the papacy. Okay? Uh, but obviously it's very linked with another question, that is whether a heretic can become pope in the first place. Those are, in my opinion, the exact same argument. Now, I know some people differentiate it, but in my opinion, it's the exact same play, uh, argument, and which is uh, what I explained here. Lastly, let us make another observation. We are discussing the question of a true pope who would fall into heresy as a private person and thus lose the papacy, which he previously had. However, in this argument, it is clear that the reason why heresy would make the pope lose the papacy is identical with the reason why someone would be impeded to receive the papacy in the first place in virtue of divine law. So if you say, that public heresy is incompatible with the papacy, it doesn't matter if it's after or before, and it's, it's the same impediment. You see what I mean? It's the same problem, it's the same obstacle. In other words, public heresy impedes someone from being the pope, whether one, he never becomes the pope in the first place, or second, ceases to be and is no longer the pope. And I put an example to explain here. Just like water impedes wood to burn, whether the wood is wet before one tries to burn it, so you have wood in water, you try to burn it, it doesn't work, all right? So I guess there's no fire. Or the wood was actually burning, but then you come with a big bag of water and, pew, and then it can't burn anymore. It's the same. It's just the water and fire, you know, drive each other out. It's the same thing. Uh, so, uh, hence, while addressing directly the question of a true pope losing the papacy through heresy, we also thereby address indirectly the question of someone who could not receive the papacy through the same impediment of heresy. But this question is, um, uh, is more of a canon law question as well. So not getting into canon law here, here we're just considering the thing from a theological perspective. Incidentally, the Council of Constance reserved the right to judge uh, doubtful pa paper elections to a general council, which would argue in favor of the common sentence that to declare the vacancy of a Roman see due to the fall of a pope into heresy is similarly reserved to no other ecclesiastical body than a general council. And, and all theologians agree on that as far as I'm uh, aware of. In the sense, some of them maybe will say the College of Cardinals, uh, but the others will say, the, the, most of the theologians will say the ecumenical council actually, to declare that a pope is a heretic, that would be the ecumenical council. Uh, there is, I think, one, I forgot who it is, that says the College of Cardinals. But in the Ecumenical Council, there is the College of Cardinals anyway, so it's kind of, um, you know, in the practical order, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's very similar. And that is whether you are the positus deponendus, uh, they, they all agree that it's, at the end of the day, the one who will make a declaration is uh, the uh, General Council. Uh, second question. So the disputed question of the heretical pope. So there we go into the dispute. Uh, purpose of this section, we neither intend nor pretend, because that's impossible, to solve a question which has been discussed for centuries. So my goal here is not to take a side, basically, but merely to present what is disputed, what is certain, and what are the practical conclusions which we may be able to draw from this discussion. Because obviously if you take a side, then all of your argumentation is very weak in the sense that uh, what about if you're wrong and the other school is right, you know? So this is why I'm, I'm just saying we're going to present the arguments of different opinions of theologians, and I would just say this is what so-and-so says, and this is what so-and-so says, and you know, that's it. 
because in any case, that's actually what theologians do, but usually they will take a side. Like uh, Bio, for example, he will say, you have the opinion of Kajetan, you have the opinion of Sandro Berberamin, and I agree with Sandro Berberamin. Okay, fine. You know, but he presents both, and then he takes a side, but he's Bio, <laughs> all right? The day I'm Bio, then I can do that, okay? <laughs> so, uh, I guess, let's just finish this paragraph. Let us therefore present the different opinions which have been given to the theological hypothesis of the heretical pope. We shall see that they can ultimately be reduced to two main positions. From this observation, after exposing more completely the arguments defended by their proponents, we shall see that we may draw a common conclusion from both theological positions. So this is where it comes uh, like a, in the case of a dilemma, you know how dilemma works? You have two possibilities, but you end up in the same place anyway, right? And this actually is what is going to happen, because we'll see the, the opinion of uh, the ponendo school and the positive school, but in a practical order, as far as we can apply it today, the conclusion will be exactly the same anyway. So you will see. So it, in, in that sense, it, it's okay. Um, so the conclusion would be, first, that the Vatican II popes are not true popes and do not have the authority to teach, rule, and sanctify the church, uh, since this has already been proven independently of this argument anyway, because of this, heretical papacy, impossible. And second, that an intervention of the church is still necessary to declare this fact. And again, both sides agree on that anyway. That whether he loses it by the declaration or whether the declaration will just observe the fact, in any case, at some point, you need the church to observe the fact. So we'll see that uh, tomorrow. Okay? <laughs>